Well, hello, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, US Elections, Economic Implications for the US and EU, brought to you by Scope Ratings. My name is Keith Mullin, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Alviz Leng Yunus, Head of Sovereign and Public Sector Ratings, who in a moment will lay out some thoughts, and after that, we'll be delighted to take your questions. So hi, Alviz, great to see you. Thank you, very happy to be here. So um, Alviz will be actually potentially bravely tackling two big topics today. First of all, how does the US really compare with the EU? Murray Draghi's recent report certainly reinforces a narrative that Europe has fallen behind, but is the gap really that large and is it growing? And second, what are the potential economic implications of the imminent US elections? And could long-term US growth drivers be affected and how? So as I said, we do want to try and make this uh, interactive. So please type any questions you have into the questions function and we'll do our best to respond. Um, Alviz does have a presentation which will be available for download. I'll explain how to do that at the end of today's session. Now, Alviz won't be commenting directly on the direction of equity bond or credit markets as a result of the topics under discussion today. As a rating agency, we prefer to stick to credit fundamentals and related factors. So that's it for me, um, Aviz. It's my pleasure to hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you all for, for joining today. So as Keith said, let's jump right in. We have two big questions to tackle. First, whether Europe is falling behind. And second, what the potential implications could be from the US. Now, I think the first very important question is whether when we compare Europe with the United States, the question is whether the US is indeed still the global safe haven asset that most market participants believe it to be. So that will be the starting point of our discussion. We'll then move briefly to some of the long-term growth drivers of the US, uh, as well as assess some of the privileges and imbalances of the US growth model, and then conclude with a view on the latest um, political developments in the US and some of the, the likely scenarios that we see evolve, even though there's certainly still significant uncertainty uh, ahead of the elections. So. Let's start right with the question, whether the US is indeed still the, the, the still uh, the AAA safe haven that, that most market participants believe it to be. In many ways, the, uh, the short answer is, is no. There is certainly no doubt that the size and the depth of the US capital markets is unmatched globally. But despite the strength and despite the size and innovation of the US economy and its institutional and military might, from a credit perspective, what's interesting is that rating agencies had doubts about the US's AAA. Let's remember that it was S&P which actually downgraded the US to AA plus back in 2011. We at Scope, we've been saying for the past few years that we rate the US at a, at a AA. And interestingly, Fitch and Moody's have recently also been converging towards that view with Fitch downgrading the US last year and Moody's assigning a negative outlook. Now. What's behind these negative rating actions? It's, it's essentially the fact that US credit risk increases each time there is a so-called debt ceiling crisis. And which, as you know, the debt ceiling limits the amount of money that the US Treasury can, can raise. But instead of actually inducing fiscal restraint, the debt ceiling is being misused by policymakers who uh, use the threat of, of default to extract political concessions from the opposing party. And Obviously, this feature of the U.S. fiscal framework is a, is a significant uh, credit weakness because every couple of years, uh, markets and, and policymakers worry about a, a near default or, or a technical default. Now, while Europe's fiscal rules are certainly not, not perfect, no member state will, will default because of them. But in the U.S., the framework is such that given the current political environment, um, the threat is, is, is certainly prevalent. And that is... That is, from a credit point of view, a, uh, a significant institutional uh, weakness, which remains unaddressed and which will also come up um, and will recur again uh, over the coming months, um, not least since the, the current debt ceiling is suspended only until January 1st of, of 2025. Um, Okay, I'll be sick. sorry to interrupt you. Can, can I just jump in um, while you're, I've got a question uh, that's come in. Um, what if the 
debt limit was suspended. Um, would that be positive for, for the US rating? In the so in in the near term, immediately it, it would because it would temporarily remove uh, the risk of, of government hitting the, the ceiling, uh, which is again relevant in the current political environment. Um, but over the medium term, I think the the key risk really is that the the U.S. lacks uh, lacks a fiscal framework that that forces policymakers to consolidate public finances. During economically good times, it, they, it's also a, a fiscal framework is ultimately missing that distinguishes between consumption and investment spending. And as we'll see later in the presentation, the U.S. public finances really are the, the main imbalance of the, of the U.S., uh, which neither candidate wants to address. And one of the one of the reasons is ultimately this uh, uh, this uh, incomplete fiscal framework. Let's say, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So and, and that that will ultimately be the most positive for the for the U.S. credit rating. Uh, so, but we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. So, let's jump right in, into a comparison of the of the EU with the with the U.S., which I think is uh, highly relevant, also in light of the of the elections and the implications. I think what's important is you know a lot is uh, is, is being said that Europe is falling behind. So let's when we look at at, at at the euro area versus the United States, I think it's important to take a, a long-term view. So when we compare uh, GDP per capita of the euro area versus the United States over the past 25 years, when the euro was introduced, we can see that over that time period, Europe did fall behind. But I would make the case that it's actually less than is often perceived. It's actually just seven percentage points vis-a-vis the level back in, in 1999. And what's interesting, I think, is that, you know, the euro, the euro area lags behind whenever there is a shock. So the, the shocks that we've seen over the, over the past uh, years, the three shocks entirely explain Europe's underperformance, which you can see in the, in the blue bar, you know, you can see the, the euro area crisis. This was the first uh, big hit to the euro area um, and the resulting fiscal, uh, fiscal restraint. Second, Europe underperformed during the COVID crisis. Um, arguably, one could make the case for the right reasons because Europe, Europe's policymakers introduced stricter uh, movement policies to preserve health, and the fiscal response was also uh, more limited and more targeted. And third, the underperformance was clearly during the energy crisis the last couple of years, which was a negative terms of trade shock for Europe as Europe had to import expensive energy, but it was a positive one for the United States as an energy exporter. So, whereas for all other years, you know, that's the green bar in this, in this, uh, in this chart, Europe actually performed just as well as the United States. Um, so, I think that the key message is yes, that there, for the Euro area as a whole, there is a bit of an underperformance, but I don't think it's as, uh, as, as bad as is often made the case. What's interesting, I think, is if we look at different member states over the past 25 years, we can see that the story in Germany is very much in line with the Euro area aggregate. We see differences in France and Italy, uh, where both countries, and especially Italy, has, has underperformed also in the non-crisis years. You can see that in the green bar. Uh, whereas you can see a bit of catching up in, in, in Spain over the during the non-crisis years. So I think what's you know when we look ahead, it, because Europe underperforms whenever there is a crisis, there's there, the euro area certainly is more susceptible to shocks and less able to absorb and reverse them. And so the question is, is Europe now more resilient to shocks? And in in many ways the answer is is yes, but but certainly the work is is incomplete. Also as the as a Draghi and and letter reports. Um, a test, um, and, and a lot of that has to do with with productivity, which um, which we can see on the next slide. And I think this is really relevant because a lot of again a lot is being said about European productivity lagging uh, behind the United States. But I think it's important that that we see that Europe is a is a um, is a compilation of countries at different stages of their economic development. So I think we need to be a bit more nuanced. I think if if we if we split Europe into three groups. Your northwest northwestern countries, so France, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, and Southern Europe. I think a very different picture emerges, and I think this this is what's what's relevant when we talk about productivity. Because what's interesting, I think, is that back in the back in ninety nine, you know, the, the average French and German worker was about ten percent less productive than the U.S. worker. 
Today, that gap has increased to about 20%. But when you, and that you can see that in the blue line in the left chart. But when you then look at this in terms of um, hours worked, you know, you can see that actually that French, German, Austrian employee is just as productive as his US counterpart for each hour work. And that just means that, 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 um, that the European worker on average is 20% less productive, but also because he works less. Now, a very different story emerges in Central and Eastern Europe where we can see the, that this has been a clear success story, productivity, both in terms of um, uh, productivity per employee and per hour worked. We can see that with the catching up process over the past 25 years. So here, the story of Europe falling behind is, is not really the case. Um, where there is clearly a problem is in Southern Europe, where we can see a, a steady deterioration, both per employee and per hour worked. Uh, and that's clearly a longstanding key policy priority for, for national and, and European authorities. Um, and certainly why the, the full implementation of next generation EU is so, is so important. So, uh, yeah. Actually, uh, sorry again to interrupt. I've got a question uh, on this. Um, so just to be absolutely clear, are you saying that productivity is only a problem in Southern Europe? And I, I, you know, it, it, that does potentially sound so optimistic. And are you underestimating the problem uh, of broader European competitiveness? I mean, per, per worker productivity is definitely deteriorating, not just in the South, south but also in, in Northwestern Europe. The, the, the only point I want to make is that Europeans choose to work less, which is why we're less productive per employee. And that's that's a value judgment. I think we, we choose to work less each day. We choose to work more part time. We choose to have longer holidays. Uh, that in itself, I don't think is a problem. What, what is a problem is that we I think we need to be reminded that if we choose to work less without compensating this uh, decrease with higher productivity, we should also expect less than we had in the past. And I think this is the case that also uh, the Draghi report really makes and that um, that our political leadership really ought to remind us uh, of. Um, there's no doubt that if we want to sustain uh, our living standards, we will have to become more productive, also, not just in the South, but uh, or in all of Europe, especially also because of the, the demographic uh, um, developments. So, so that needs to be compensated by, by higher productivity. It's just that, again, it's a... It's a it's a um, it's a value judgment to to what, how much time we, we spend working and yeah that's simply the the, the point that this chart uh, wants to make the, the story is a bit more nuanced than to say that all of Europe is less productive that's that's the okay. that's the that's the idea. Thanks. Um, let me just jump in. Also, a final point, an important point, also in terms of the growth outlook, comparing Europe with the US is certainly demographics, as, as just mentioned. Um, what's interesting is that looking ahead for the next 25 years, we can see that both the US and Europe will face a decline in their working age population based on current citizens. Uh, what's interesting is that the US will compensate or is expected to compensate this with, with migrants, whereas um, the European member states are not. And so we can clearly see here that uh, the US has a, has a much more favorable trajectory. Um, and uh, a key question here for Europe is therefore whether it's willing and able to attract uh, and integrate foreign workers into its labor markets, but also for the United States, you know, will the US continue to keep a relatively open border after the elections? I think that's a key question for, uh, for growth uh, over the next, next couple of years. Um, but I think, you know, combining these different factors, I think for the near term, so for the next couple of years, it's clear that the U.S.'s growth outlook is, is more favorable. Again, it's partly dri driven by, by demographics, but also by, by productivity, where we had estimated that the U.S. has a 2% uh, potential growth, whereas the euro area only about 1 to, to 1.5. As I said, the key challenge is to raise productivity, um, but not just in the South. The other uh, key challenge and big question for Europe is certainly uh, Germany, whether Germany will recover and whether Germany will become the, the European growth engine again. Um, and yeah, and I think this, for, you know, from the European point of view, this, this, the, the German outlook is certainly very uh, is, is, is fundamental. And uh, 
it's fundamental also because of because of the recommend in in, in light of the con of the recommendations of the of the Draghi report that further European integration is simply needed and it's it's, it's a big question whether Germany but also France currently has the, that political capital to to push the necessary reforms to raise the European growth outlook and that's why in the near term certainly the US has a, has an advantage here. So, so uh, actually, Alvita, I'm going to interrupt you again. I do, I do apologize, but um, look, you, you mentioned productivity in Southern Europe in the previous slide. Um, and this one, you know, you, you clearly at the top, you say will generally recover. Now, both Germany and France face uh, some pretty considerable challenges. Um, and I'm just thinking about the importance of both economies to the, to the European Union as a whole. And it's probably worth referencing here that Scope downgraded France's long term ratings on October the 18th. Um, I guess the question is, isn't how, success, how successfully they manage through their current challenges, isn't that the major factor of concern here? Uh, for Europe, yes, certainly. The, the out, so for Europe, the outlooks for France and Germany are, are, are far more important than the outcome of the US elections, even if the US election certainly has an important implication uh, also for European economies, especially Germany, actually. Um, but the key risk for both, and we've, we've highlighted this also in our rating action, is that they're both increasingly characterized by political fragmentation. And the, as a result, they face a period of political uncertainty and, and paralysis. And in, in France, this was clearly the, the, the driver for the, for the downgrade or the challenging political outlook complicates the um, consolidation of public finances. And even if the Barnier government survives until the next presidential elections, it's not clear uh, or, or, or unlikely that, 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 uh, that the government will, uh, will push significant reforms, let alone the reforms of which Maria Draghi is talking about at the European level. And then also in Germany, you know, Germany has been stagnant essentially for the past five years economically. And uh, Germany also faces elections next October. And it's totally unclear whether the next German government uh, will have it any easier in passing reforms compared to the current one. Um, so it's not, you know, um, Germany certainly, we, we expect Germany to grow next year, but because of the demographic decline in Germany, which is really steep, um, and also because of the 15 year accumulated investment gap, significant reforms are needed. And it's, it's not clear at this moment whether the next German government uh, will be will have a stable majority and will have a mandate for re for reform. Um, a lot can happen again until next October, and maybe also voter preferences will shift depending on what we see in the US. So I think that's uh, something to keep in mind. But I think clearly the Europe when we compare the EU with the United States, the the outlook for Europe I would say very much depends certainly more on on the political leadership in both of these countries. That that and that's clearly a, a key question. Um, yeah, so let me, let me, also conscious of time, let me, let me perhaps jump, uh, jump further into some of the, you know, some of the privileges and imbalances of, of the US uh, growth model, which um, certainly also are a key uh, rating driver. So we certainly have to start with the US dollar. Uh, I'll be very brief here. Um, as, as you all know, the US dollar remains the global reserve currency. The euro is a, a distant but, but stable second that's basically unchanged over the past 25 years. The use of the dollar has declined slightly since the first Trump administration and also um, since the imposition of sanctions on Russia, but just but not very much. I think it's fair to say that we expect this to stay like, to stay like this for over the coming years. Uh, so the shift towards a, a multipolar currency world is, while possible, it, it seems distant at this point. So this strength, the strength of the role of the US dollar is, in our view, uh, likely to remain a key strength for the US for the foreseeable um, future. And, and similarly, also uh, a key strength and something that Europe certainly wants to catch up on is the depth of capital markets. When we compare the EU with the US, we see that uh, relative to GDP, the capital markets are about three times uh, deeper. Obviously, with the associated benefits for, for corporate funding, uh, we know this is a key policy priority for Europe with pushing for the capital markets union. The, the point is, Europe does not need to reach US levels, but obviously in terms of um, corporate funding, uh, but 
already reaching the levels of the UK or Japan would, would be a big, uh, a big step forward. And both of these factors, I, I just mentioned them briefly, both of these factors, the, the role of the US dollar and the deep capital markets, they're, they're highly relevant, obviously, for the, for the US rating, but also for US uh, fiscal imbalances, because uh, some argue that, well, it's, what's certainly clear is that both of these strengths afford the US the largest fiscal space. Uh, and some would argue that for this reason, fiscal balances in the US just don't, don't really matter. Um, on that, we, we disagree. We, 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 we expect the US to have by far the largest deficits of the advanced economies over the coming years at around six to 8%. Uh, and as a result, a continuously rising debt level, which will reach about 140% uh, over the coming years. And I think what's worrying, and this goes back to the first question of the fiscal framework, what's worrying is that neither presidential candidate uh, is thinking about uh, introducing policies to, to, uh, to, to consolidate U.S. public finances, quite the opposite. We, we see that U.S. policymakers, in a way, um, uh, believe that there is no limit. To, to their fiscal expansion, uh, which very much contrasts with Europe, where we are aware of these limits uh, and where the, where, the, where the discussion has shifted towards rebuilding fiscal buffers after the COVID and energy crisis. Whereas in the US, the, the, the proposed policies of, of Harris and, and, and Trump are, are, um, are expansionary, certainly with a lot of, of uncertainty, but um, the, the models we've seen estimate that, the, that uh, a Harris presidency would likely at about one to two trillion uh, of additional deficits over the next 10 years, whereas the policies um, proposed by Trump are in the range of four to six trillion. So that's, um, that's clearly a, 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 key, a key risk. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's something, that, so this expansionary fiscal stance is, 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 is a key risk because it's likely to, uh, it may help the ne in the near term, the, the growth outlook, uh, as we've seen also during COVID, but over the medium term, um, it leads to higher debt uh, and uh, possibly higher uh, an increase in risk premium. It is inflationary and it may therefore limit the Fed's ability to cut rates faster. And all of this raises interest payments. Um, so yeah, that's okay. That's okay. why this is tricky. That, a tricky outlook. Yeah. So the, what, I, I guess the, the, the question about de fiscal deficits is. What's behind them? Is it is it lower taxes or higher expenditure? Um, what do you think will be an appropriate consolidation strategy? Now that's tricky because a, a lot is said about U.S. taxes. Uh, clearly, that's one of the areas where uh, Trump and Harris uh, dis disagree, and, and or, or their policy proposals to truly differ. Um, I would make the case that the main fiscal pressures, however, for the US are not whether the tax cuts are suspended or extended, but they're rather from the expenditures. Um, so for, from our point of view, the US does not have a revenue, but, but rather an, an expenditure problem. Um, I think you can see that clearly with the CBO estimates, which, uh, which show that over the next 10 years, um, expenditures, 90% uh, of, the, of the expenditure increase over the next uh, 10 years will come from interest payments and social security. And those are exact, those are areas which are uh, simply unlikely to be addressed. Interest payments are, are in a way a given and, uh, and addressing social security and, and Medicare and Medicaid are uh, pot politically really, really hard to, to tackle. And so, these expenditure increases are therefore very likely to materialize, and it, it, it's those which will affect the, the fiscal imbalances. Um, and uh, I think you see that actually, you know, uh, as I said, the, the higher debt, the, so the fiscal deficits and the higher debt, they result in higher interest payments. And I think that what's very interesting is that the US will spend uh, more than 10%, actually up to 12% of its government revenue on. Uh, on interest payments, which is the highest since the Paul Volcker years, which is when we were in a totally different macroeconomic environment. And it's a lot higher than any uh, Euro area country. So that's, uh, that's clearly something that, uh, um, that, that, that is a, an increasing uh, credit uh, weakness. And similarly, you know, 
obviously these are not this is not the same as as, as that but there are still uh, moral obligations associated with them is the the contingent liabilities especially from from healthcare which again are significantly larger in the US compared to to Europe so that the bottom line th this is the one let's say the one macroeconomic imbalance that the US has and it's the one that is likely to 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 get worse regardless of who the president will will be so i think this is worth asking you know when when will will markets re react to to this to this imbalance when we um talk or compare about the europe and and the us the other key key topic that we've seen uh over the past few years clearly is energy uh this is certainly a um uh, a key advantage for the United States, given the abundant natural gas that the U.S. has as it's become a, a, an energy exporter. And this is a key strength for Europe, uh, sorry, for the United States. And it affords the U.S. obviously a, a huge competitive advantage in terms of lower energy costs for, for households and, and businesses. Clearly something that, um, that uh, also the Draghi report really highlights and, and an advantage that is likely to, to stay. Um, Still, I think it's also important to, to, to remind ourselves that this advantage, this energy advantage, it really comes also at a, at a big environmental cost. Um, because if we all lived like citizens of the United States, uh, we would need the natural resources of five Earths uh, compared to the average three that we need in, in, in Europe or, or in China. And I think this is relevant because if, if policymakers really are serious about moving our economies towards carbon neutrality by 2050, then Europe actually has an advantage compared to the US in terms of the starting point, because Europe is more fossil fuel efficient to, in terms of generating growth uh, compared to the US and certainly more so than, than China. So the opportunity is certainly here for Europe in the next few years to demonstrate that it can you know, afford its living standards without living beyond its natural means. There is a long way to go, but the starting point is certainly better for, for Europe than the US. The key question, the key challenge uh, also highlighted in the Draghi report is whether Europe is able to drive the green uh, economy and develop the necessary clean, uh, clean technologies and obviously to have a comprehensive uh, green industrial, industrial policy. And, and this will, you know, uh, the developments here certainly will also be affected by the US uh, election outcome. So. Conscious of time, let me let me jump right into into the U.S. now, and how these factors, you know, governance, fiscal imbalances, energy, climate, uh, may be affected. So, I think an important starting point is that uh, you know is that both uh, Republicans and Democrats they they don't disagree about everything, even if that's often <laughs> perceived that way. I think it's uh, it's important to highlight that Democrats and Republicans. They very much agree that China is a strategic rival, and uh, as and that very much informs the U.S.'s uh, industrial policy, its protectionist uh, stance uh, towards key in key industries and, and sectors, and that's that's a shared priority and a shared view of, among uh, both parties. Similarly, in terms of foreign policy, I think it's it's also the case that both parties share the view that the U.S. external engagement should be more contained or more targeted. And as stated also on fiscal policy, both share a, an expansionary uh, fiscal stance. Where there are significant differences are, are on climate and energy, uh, where Democrats favor renewables, whereas Republicans are more in favor of fossil fuels and, and nuclear energy. Clearly, geopolitics and support for NATO, where, where Democrats are more uh, supportive of, of the alliance and Republicans certainly more, more skeptical. On immigration too, there are important differences where, where Democrats are more su supportive of seeking ways to legalize uh, illegal migrants, whereas um, Trump has vowed to uh, deport uh, illegal, uh, I I yeah, Ill illegal migrants at the moment, which would have an, you know, an impact certainly on the labor market growth and inflation. And finally, also on the on the role of the Fed, there is there is disagreement with with Democrats uh, supporting the independence of the Fed, whereas Trump and especially his vice president Vance have um, uh, have, have challenged to some degree the the independence of the Fed and have argued for a strong uh, thirty percent devaluation of the of the U.S. dollar. So I think 
the, 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 the key is in terms of, you know, in terms of the policy preferences is that there are some which are shared uh, where the outcome of the election is less relevant, whereas some, they are really quite different, which is why the outcome of the election really, really does matter. So when it comes to the election, I think, um, obviously, we're just five days to go, um, and, and there is still a lot of uncertainty here. Um, I think the, the main, a couple of points I think that, that I'd like to make is that one, is not just, it's not just about the White House, it really is about Congress as well. Um, so the House of Representatives and the election in the Senate are, are just as just as important. Um, who will win the White House? That's uh, frankly a coin toss at this at this moment. We all know that the the popular vote is not is not what's what's relevant. We know that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million, and she still lost the election. So this is all about the uh, electoral college and the and the few uh, swing states that that really matter. I think what's interesting is the is the increasing observation that there is, because of voter mobilization and, and polarization, an increasing correlation between whoever wins the White House may also be more likely to win the House of Representatives. Um, whereas this time around, at least when it comes to the Senate, because there are more seats up for election of the of the Democrats, it's actually more likely that the Republicans will win the will win the Senate. So on that on that basis, you know, I think we, we, we can actually derive a few uh, high-level scenarios. Um, let me jump right into that, which is, a, there's a lot of information on this slide, but because we have three elections that really matter and we always have two outcomes, we have eight scenarios that we, that we can deal with uh, and that we can expect. Not all of them are equally likely, no, nor are they all equally uh, relevant. Um, but I think what is, as I said, it, at the moment, I think it's simply too close to make a prediction as regards the White House. So, um, but what we can say, I think, is that if Harris were to win, she is also more likely to win the House of, of Representatives and also likely to face a Republican Senate, which would be essentially scenario two. Uh, on the other hand, if Trump wins, he's also more likely to win the House and the Senate, which would essentially be a control of Congress. So that would be scenario eight. The, the other scenarios, again, are more of a, uh, are, they're all possible, don't get me wrong, they're possible. I think they're just uh, probably less likely. And in terms of policy implications, they're also, uh, because they imply a divided government, they're also less likely to result in more a, in, in, in larger policy swings. So they're likely to be uh, to result in, in some legislative gridlock to varying degrees and negotiation and, and compromise. Um, and I think here, uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's, what's relevant to highlight is, you know, what are the implications if, if either of these scenarios materializes, you know, I think for, let, let's start with Europe, you know, I think for, for Europe, a, a Harris presidency and a greater control of, of Congress in many ways would imply broad policy continuity and more predictability and, and the continued strong alliance with the US and NATO and, and support for Ukraine. But I think Europe's response in this scenario will also very much matter. And I think here the key risk would really be uh, European complacency, especially regarding security and defense. But there's also the risk that the Harris administration really pushes for an aggressive and, and very active green industrial policy that also incentivizes European uh, companies to, to relocate to the US. So on foreign policy and defense, clearly scenario two is more, more favorable, but on Europe's, let's say, aspire to green leadership, it's probably more, more challenging. Now, if we move towards scenario eight, uh, this is the scenario where Trump wins and he controls uh, Congress. I, I think in many ways, this could be quite destabilizing, uh, certainly on foreign policy and defense, we should expect less support for NATO and, and the war in Ukraine, and therefore significant strategic and fiscal pressures for, for Europe uh, immediately. Economically, the risk of, of tariffs, a deeper trade war, lower growth and inflationary pressures are, are certainly all, uh, all possible. Climate change and energy, as, as stated, there is the risk of the US reversing its commitment to addressing climate change, and that could incentivize other European countries to also 
uh, halt or even reverse their commitments to the green um, agenda. And what's interesting is that some, some argue that this could, um, that a potential silver lining of, of this scenario eight under a Trump presidency is that, um, that, that, that Trump could be an accelerator for European integration. Um, I'm a bit more more skeptical on, on that simply because I think that there's enough politicians in Europe who, who favor Trump's uh, approach and, and policies. And in that sense, there is actually the risk that Trump would uh, further divide Europe. Um, the real upside that I could potentially see, but again, it's, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a possibility, is that a second Trump presidency is likely to be quite volatile uh, and, and even chaotic. And here, I think Europe could demonstrate its relative stability and predictability as a, as a key strength that is valued by by markets. So that's just in a yeah in a very natural in a high level the the, the, the scenarios that are there and their uh, relative uh, implications for for Europe and uh, and and the US. Uh, I'll, uh, before we move on, very quick, I'm, I'm getting conscious of time, but I just wanted to get this question in if I could. Um, and you've laid out some, I mean, there's a great slide, some uh, very uh, insightful um, uh, uh, agendas there. But what's the biggest risk to the US and potentially even the global economy of a second Trump presidency? Potentially a bit of a loaded question, but uh, can you sort of pinpoint some one of the two or three factors mm -hmm. here? I mean, I think for for the U.S., it very much depends on Congress. So I think that's why the, the, the elections for the House and the Senate are so fundamental, because if even if Trump wins, if he were to face a divided uh, government, the risks of, there would be checks and balances and the risks of extreme policies would be significantly lower. But if he wins and also and Republicans also control both the House and, and the Senate, I think for the US, the biggest risk would be a, a weakening in, in governance and an institutional quality um, and, and predictability. And I think I think that's uh, that's uh, again the, the the Nobel Prize was just afforded awarded this this year to to the economists showing the importance of institutional and uh, quality and, and governance uh, as as a real underpinning of the creation of wealth and and power. And so I think the risk is that. Uh, institutional risk increases under a Trump presidency and that that really uh, weakens institutions and even and politicizes them to to an extent that is difficult to reverse in, in the future. Um, for the global economy, uh, I would say the main risk is a combination of significant US fiscal stimulus and a, a trade war that simply results in higher inflation. Um, and therefore higher interest rates for, for longer. Uh, there's the risk of uh, divergence of central bank policies because so long as the Fed remains independent, the Fed would need to most likely halt rate cuts in this scenario. Um, and higher US yields for, for longer would have a, a negative impact, certainly on US growth, but also the funding and the, um, so the cost of borrowing for other uh, economies and therefore their growth outlooks. And I think that would probably be the most negative combination for, for, for the global economic outlook. And again, for Europe, the key risk is security and defense. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, commi it's the U.S. commitment to NATO. If it's not forthcoming or if it's wavering, uh, I think the strategic and fiscal pressures, um, in light of the, the, the support for Ukraine, I think that that's for Europe, probably the most important. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Let me just briefly just jump on on you know the uh, implications for the U.S. itself. You know, because as I started with uh, you know with the question whether the U.S. is a is a global uh, safe haven asset and um, what, what would the what would it, what would the outcome mean for the U.S. credit rating? I think at the very high level, I think it's important to, to distinguish between the near and, and, and the medium term also, because I think in the near term, a, a big risk could certainly be a, a very narrow democratic victory, which would not be, which would be challenged uh, by Trump, uh, certainly in the courts and possibly also on the streets. So I think the risk of social unrest in the near term is quite high in that, in that case. 
Um, our baseline is that if that were to happen, that uh, this test of U.S. institutions would uh, would prevail, just as it did in 2020. Um, and we therefore distinguish between this near-term risk and the medium-term risk, because in the medium term, once the dust settles and once the new administration settles in, the outlook for the U.S. very much depends on the implications for, for governance, uh, so the debt, you know, discussions around the debt ceiling, the fiscal imbalances, and the role of the U.S. dollar. And again, on governance, the debt ceiling we, we discussed, uh, it's, uh, it, the, the, the negotiations will, will have to come again in, in Q1 next year. The fiscal imbalances will deteriorate under both uh, candidates, although more so under, under Trump, more likely. Uh, and again, on, on governance and institutional quality here, the risk under a Trump presidency is certainly higher. Um, and that may also have uh, an implication uh, on the role of the US dollar. So that's... Uh, just yeah, high level some of the some of the implications of the of the elections. So let me uh, let me stop here. Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Alviza. Um, I think uh, we covered the questions as you were going along. Um, there was a question on whether Europe would be better off if the EU didn't exist, but I suggest that's beyond the scope of our conversation today. <laughs> So yes. we'll leave that to somebody else to answer. Um, but um, let me just check quickly to see if there are any more questions. Um, just a very quick one. If there's a question, which is, can you please uh, tell us the global economic implications of a Harris victory on trade growth markets? You kind of covered it in the slide to some extent, but do you want to just, just to highlight a couple of points that you would say there? I mean, I think one well, the first thing to note is that the, 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 the economic uh, programs and, and policies of both candidates are, are still uh, not very, very detailed, so it's very hard to, to say. I think the main, uh, the, the main implication would most likely be uh, a, probably a combination of, of, of the Biden and Obama years. So, some, so we would certainly expect more continuity and, um, and therefore also a, a simply more, more stable uh, policy-making environment for Again, on this scenario, I, th I think, um, you know, I, I would expect, uh, again, gro growth to remain uh, in, in the realm of around around 2%. I think the discussions on, 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 um, on, on, on tariffs would probably be more um, fa favorable, certainly, with, with European allies. Uh, they might be also, let's say, probably more constructive with China. But again, it's, it's up. It's very much uh, still up for grabs. I would say it's it's hard to to make it a, a clear distinction. But I think the I think the tone, I think the approach, I think the, the the institutional quality, the predictability of the process, I think that very much matters here uh, for, for 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 the implications for markets, rather than let's say ad hoc transactional um, announcements. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we've we've. Uh come to the end of our question so let me um close the session uh if i may at least thank you so much for uh, your insightful comments you covered a lot of ground there um in some really good depth so i appreciate that thank you to our viewers for uh, for tuning in and watching and um, staying till the bitter end hope you found that um helpful i did say at the beginning that you were i could show you how to download the presentations deck um and let me do that now so if you click on the bo bottom of the screen apps and then click on handouts. Um, hopefully, oh well, with the best laid plans, it's not there. And and so let me. We will circulate the slide deck to 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 those who have registered for it. And um, any further questions, please feel free to contact myself or perhaps in more specifically to uh, contact Elvis, and he'll be happy with his team to answer them. Uh, so that's it. Uh, well, actually, no, I've just, I thought the, the PDF has just come off my screen, so um, so you can actually download it now. Um, and so uh, I'll give you two seconds or so just to do that. Um, we will do more of these sessions um, as uh, as appropriate um, and as time, uh, as we if we have time. But um, thanks again for your uh, interest. Uh, our, yeah, outreach is continuous, so look out for our next session. Uh, so until then, it's goodbye from us.